Hello, everybody. My name's Tristan, and I am a citizen scientist. Now, the great thing about citizen science is that you don't need to know anything about science at all, really. Um, all you need is the internet, some curiosity or some concern about an issue, and some basic tools. So what I've learned over the past year of my own citizen science endeavor is that the curiosity and the concern exist as does the internet. Obviously, that is absolutely everywhere. What we're missing in the abundance that we really need is the tools to, to bridge that gap. So what I'd like to talk to you today about, the tool makers, is open source knowledge and open hardware's ability to help citizens interface with and sometimes even solve the pressing issues of our time. So to start off with, I'd like to say a few examples of what I'm talking about to give you a taste. And some of these projects you may be aware of already. If you're not, I um, advise that you take note and potentially look up and support some of these projects in whatever way you can. So Prote is um, building open source hardware for the oceans. They're building um, open source monitoring systems that can autonomous, autonomously guide themselves through the sea to either clean up oil spills or to detect environmental factors in the sea. Very interesting project right there. Um, Farmbot and Open Farm are also another very unique project. They're based in California. Um, my friend Rory Aronson has been recently Shuttleworth funded to get these endeavors off the ground. Farmbot is an open source precision farming project. So we have commercial examples of these that are basically making our agricultural systems uber efficient so we can grow as much crops as we can via automated machines. Rory is working on an open source version of this. And interestingly, he's linking it to something called Open Farm, which is the Wikipedia for growing stuff. They've recently um, launched this on Kickstarter, and they were successfully funded, I believe, 300%. Like a lot of our open projects, there seems to be a lot of support out there for these ideas. And um, I suggest you look these both up, and potentially, if you're a gardener or an agriculturalist, add some of your own knowledge to Open Farm. It will inform the, um, the physical process of the precision farming machine farm bot. The Open Source Seed Initiative is another great project. Um, some of you might be aware that one of the huge problems that we face in the industrialization of our agriculture is that um, companies such as Monsanto are patenting seed varieties, genetically alter altering them, patenting them, and then putting very strict limitations on the way uh, farmers are able to use them. Normally, farmers will uh, re-sow seeds of the previous season. They're now legally not allowed to do this because of uh, patent restrictions Monsanto has enforced. So what the Open Source Seeds Initiative is doing is uh, essentially open sourcing uh, or openly licensing some of these seed varieties. They're growing heirloom seeds, and they're openly licensing them to make it more difficult for that to happen which is very important. I, I suggest you check them out, and you can also order seeds from them. Safecast is another one you may have heard about. Um, Safecast are building open hardware technologies that allow citizens to safely monitor radioactive environments and map the data that they source. Essentially, what they've built is a sensor that you can place on the outside of your car. You drive around the area in question, and the data is mapped on a map um, which all users are able to interface with. Uh, this was recently uh, used in Fukushima when the disaster happened in Japan. Falling Fruit is, in, is a great project, a bit more fun, maybe less ominous than radioactivity. Uh, <laughs> they are a project that's local to where I live in Denver, Colorado, um, in Boulder. And what Falling Fruit does is it's essentially a mapping platform whereby you can log local plant varieties that can feed you. So you'd be actually really surprised, and I suggest you log on and see. Look in your local area on fallingfruit.org. You, you'd be really shocked at the fruit varieties that grow down your street. 
I recently found there's a papaya plant growing somewhere in Denver, which is very surprising, um, being a mile above sea level. So uh, the Smart Citizen is another great project that Thomas was talking about earlier. This is uh, something that's come out of Fab Lab Barcelona. Um, it allows citizens to monitor ambient environmental factors in urban cities and to share that data openly on the platform. You know, Thomas did a great job explaining that earlier, so I probably don't need to say much more. You can see that at smartcitizen.me. And Public Lab, which everyone seems to have been raving about at this conference, and I'm so happy they have been because it's a fantastic project. Um, Public Lab, if it hasn't already been made clear, are developing open, cheap tools that allow citizens to effectively monitor their local environments and build solutions about the data that they're generating. Uh, and just because I love them so much, I'm going to show that active crowdfunding campaign right now, which is up on Kickstarter. Um, I believe the last chap who was presenting Kickstarter said we couldn't download Kickstarter videos, but I did it. So here it is. From the open source community that brought you the balloon mapping kit and the infogram plant camera comes a new project to measure oil contamination. There's some kind of leak. It's flowing into the drain. It's not stopping. We're going to need help. The Public Lab community works collaboratively to investigate environmental problems. Dear fellow Public Lab members, we've discovered a leak near a street drain. We think it could be oil. Well, if you want to identify the polluter, you'll need to collect some evidence. How is this done in the lab? How about measuring fluorescence? You get the sample to glow with a UV light and you measure the color. Could we build something that could do that? We could use a laser pen and a DVD to separate the colors. That would keep the cost down. Then a webcam could cheaply measure the colors. We'll have to dissolve the sample so we can light it up. Then we'll need some software. All open source, of course. Most importantly, we'll need to compare it to some known samples to find a match. For that part, we can all help. Today, we're inviting you to pitch in and help take the oil testing kit to the next level. The public lab community really works together like this, and so could you if you join. We're designing the kit to be affordable, easy to use, yet precise. And of course, open source, so you can download the plans and build one yourself today. It uses a UV laser, a narrow slit to let a beam of light in, a piece of DVD to diffract the beam, and a webcam. These parts fit into a carefully sized cardboard frame, and then into a lightproof box, like this prototype. There's a lot left to do, and if we all work together, we can make affordable pollution detection a reality. Remember, we're not a company selling a product. We're an open source community supported by a nonprofit, and we're asking for your involvement. So from all of us in the Public Lab community, we look forward to working with you. How about a round of applause for that? So yeah, that was, as, as a filmmaker myself, I appreciate the Wes Anderson inspired video they just did. It's very good. Um, so what do these projects all share in common? They've all identified a problem. They've developed a solution. And most importantly, they've built pathways for participation in that solution. They've also recognized the value that citizens can play in those solutions. So in November of last year, so roughly a year ago, some collaborators and I <laughs> decided we were going to address a, pr a problem you may have heard about um, in the form of bee decline. Now, if you haven't heard about this problem, um, let me just explain. So bees pollinate 70 of the top 100 staple food crops that we as humans rely on around the world. Now, the problem is that bees have been dying in unprecedented numbers over the past few years, and we're not sure why. So what you see here is something called the Colorado Top Bar, which is a design we've developed uh, for an open source beehive. This is called the Barcelona Ware, which is another beehive design developed by uh, collaborator John Minchin over in Fab Lab Barcelona. Now, if you want to make one of these beehives for yourself, you essentially download our files, 
from the internet, you get yourself a sheet of plywood, and you cut them out using a CNC router machine. They cut out in approximately an hour, and um, cut from a single sheet of plywood, and when they all slot together without screws or glues, what you're left with are these two beehives. Now, these beehives have been developed um, around what is known as natural beekeeping principles. So what, they, what we're trying to do is lower stress factors on the bees. One of the problems is actually man-made, that beekeepers are putting stress on the bees in order to make them produce more honey, which is often the commercial opportunity in beekeeping, at the expense often of the bees' health. So both of these hives embrace naturalistic beekeeping methods, which are known as top bar beekeeping is one form which we've embraced, which allow the bees more control over their own environment, rather than putting something called foundation comb into the hive, which is often made out of industrial plastics. Um, you allow the bees to build their entire own honeycomb structure, which takes them longer, but again, puts less stress on the bees, less foreign substances in the hive. So we released this project out into the world, uh, as I said, in November of last year. And the uptake has been, we've been pretty happy with the uptake. We've had approximately, we sold 50 hives over our um, crowdfunding campaign, which we did via Indiegogo. Sorry to the Kickstarter guy. Um, and over that period, uh, we sold 50 hives. And since then, probably around another 20, 30 have been built remotely, um, and new ones pop up all the time. We're not actually sure how many are out there. Um, the, the files are entirely openly licensed. You can sell them yourself if you'd like. Um, we, we have no limitations on that whatsoever. So hives are really nice. Pretty hives are better. But that's not really addressing the root of the problem here. The root of the problem is that bee research is for sale. And when I say this, I'm not sugarcoating or being too extreme. It is literally for sale. Often we understand that complicated research requires a lot of money. Big research, big money. Uh, the problem is that a lot of that money is coming from the companies which are causing the problem. The Syngentas, the Bayers, the Monsantos of the world. Monsanto being particularly audacious to the extent of actually buying a research institute called Biologics, which at the time was considered the leading bee research institute on the planet, do we really think we can now trust the data coming out of Biologics? No, we do not. So what do we do about this? Well, the Open Source Beehives Project is making hives and aiming to uh, enable new beekeepers to decentralize the keeping of bees from commercial entities which often keep thousands of hives in a single place. We're trying to distribute that so that we have multiple backyard beekeepers um, maintaining bee populations locally, helping ecologies to thrive locally. But on top of this, we're developing a sensor board which any citizen will be able to buy, input into their hive, and start to monitor and produce data on health-affecting um, elements within the hive and to share that online. Now, any user, be they a um, citizen, gardener, or a data scientist, will be able to download and make sense of this data in whatever capacity they feel they would like to. That's our project, the Open Source Beehives project, and uh, we encourage anybody with sensor skills especially to um, come to our website, help us collaborate, um, and build the most robust sensor system we can. We may actually be um, putting this data onto the Smart Citizen platform. We're talking about the partnership around that. That would be fantastic. And uh, finally, I'd like to leave us on this note, which is that at times it can seem as though nature and technology are at odds with each other. But I feel very strongly, and my collaborators on the project feel very strongly, that we're reaching so many tipping points with our climate that it is our job as innovators and people who understand how to manipulate technology and use it for good to apply what we know to solve some of these issues, be they pollution, be they ecological decline and conservation. There are so many ways in which we can really use our skills to help resolve some of these issues. And I encourage everybody to think, 
what do they know? What do they care about? How can they apply it to those things? Because we really need everybody here to do that. Thank you very much.